Decline from evil and do good. Seek after peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are upon the just, and his ears unto their prayers. But the countenance of the Lord is against them that do evil things. Words from today's lesson. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Last Sunday, we reflected on how individual members, or cells, as it were, in the mystical body of Christ, need to be nourished. Nourished through the most precious bloodstream flowing from the Sacred Heart. The precious blood brings us the supernatural glucose of grace. And without this glucose from heaven, we will eventually die and be flushed out of the body into the sewer of hell. On this day in 1917, July 13, Our Lady showed the children of Fatima what hell looked like. It's interesting, if you study anything about the demons, I don't recommend a lot of that, but... They're always talking about things of the sewer. Fits them. That's where they are. In the sewer of the universe. Just as the hormone insulin is what opens up cells in our physical bodies to receive the glucose being transported by the bloodstream of the body, so too in the mystical body, the insulin of devotion and piety is required to open and unlock the doors of the soul to grace, to glucose from heaven. The more devoted we are at the Mass, the more we desire to sup with the Lord, using His own words, the more graces we will receive, the more open we will be, the more exposed we are to heaven's gifts. Yet, there is a disease that affects the production and the effect of insulin upon the cells of the body. What is this disease? Well, we know it. We talked about it last Sunday. Diabetes. Everybody knows about diabetes. And there's two forms. There's type 1 and there's type 2. Now, type 1 is caused by our own immune systems attacking the production of insulin. This represents the failure of the church's parishes, her pastors, and even her families. The failure of these people to provide regular devotions and pious exercises and other such things. This certainly has happened. No denying it. We're suffering from type 1 all over in the church today. Now, type 2, however, follows from a certain resistance to insulin's ability to open up a cell, to unlock it to the glucose of grace, primarily due to obesity and lack of exercise. That's the causes of diabetes. We become spiritually obese in our being attached to things of this world. Attachments make us fat in the spiritual life. Not fat in the good way, fat in the bad way. These physical things, they could be physical things, material things, but usually they're, they're much more serious. They're spiritual attachments, bad memories, and other things. We lack spiritual exercise because we fail to practice and deepen our devotions. Both of these lead to our resisting the ability of supernatural insulin to open us up to the precious bloodstream of the church. Now this means we must strive to slim down by detaching while practicing our spiritual exercises if we hope to receive the required grace to remain alive and well in the mystical body of Christ unto eternal life. In a word, the essence of the spiritual life this is worth thinking about over and over again. Put it on your heart. Write it on your mind. The essence of the spiritual life is simply this. Responding to grace. Responding to grace. To be open to the knocking at the door of our souls. 
That's the essence of the spiritual life. Because once you open and you say yes to God, then you keep saying yes and you go one step after another. You go from grace to grace to grace until you receive the grace of glory in heaven. That's the spiritual life in a nutshell. Our Lord himself explained this in so many words to St. John in the Apocalypse. Behold, I stand at the gate. I stand at the door and I knock. If any man shall hear my voice and open to me the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. To him that shall conquer, to him that shall overcome, I will give to sit with me in my throne as I also have overcome and am set down with my father in his throne. Apocalypse chapter 3. Now once, St. John Vianney was asked why people go to hell. Why are they flushed down in the sewer? He always answers very simply, if you know St. John Vianney. He said, because they refuse to cooperate with the Holy Ghost. That's it. They refuse to respond. They refuse to open up. Now last Sunday... We reflected on the example provided by St. Mary Goretti and her assailant, Alessandro Serenelli. Given the lesson from St. Peter that we heard today and the gospel from the Sermon on the Mount, let us return to hear the rest of the story about Alessandro, who clearly suffered from a very acute case of type 2 spiritual diabetes but finally responded to the abundance of insulin provided by the virgin martyr's death and heroic acts of love, proving, proving that we can help each other in the mystical body, that we can, as it were, earn enough insulin for another cell to open up. Don't give up on that soul that you know that's all closed off to God. Start earning some insulin for him. And he'll open up. When the time is right. Now the info used here, you're going to hear about, comes from this excellent book, The Penitent, by Pietro Di Donato. I recommend it. It's a good read. First, a little background from this book on Alessandro. From his youth, he said, My mother died when I was only a few years old. I never knew her. Without a mother's tender care and direction, my life started out on the wrong foot. How important it is to practice devotions with our children from the earliest years. That's what he's saying. I'd have a mother there to teach me my devotions. He learned how to read and unfortunately read anti-clerical and atheistic literature. In magazines, he read about murders. For example, one article described a working girl who was stabbed to death by a mad lover in the 1830s. Imagine that. He was reading about this. He underlined passages from various articles. I'm not going to read them to you. I actually was going to read a couple, but they're so bad, I decided it's just not fitting. But we can see this poor young man was filled with messages emanating from hell via the French Revolution, Karl Marx, Nietzsche, and the Marquis de Sade, from whom we get the word sadism. All this served to raise his inordinate desires and to deaden his conscience. We all know of the crime he finally committed, putting into action what he had read and pondered over so long. Apparently what appealed to him and attracted him to Maria was the immolation of the pure, which meant to him a secret defiance of society, a perversion of goodness. Things he read about in his magazines. We must never forget the principle, first in intention, last in execution. First you think about it, it puts it in your mind, then you go and you do it. Well, that teaches us to always avoid putting senseless, 
worldly ideas into our minds. Fight bad thoughts and desires, lest we eventually put them into action. Garbage in will produce garbage out. Garbage in leads to garbage out. Think of all the garbage, hellish garbage, people are putting into their minds today via TV, internet, and all things Hollywood. It will come out. It will come out. Somehow. This contributes to the obesity that leads very much to spiritual diabetes. There are some of our attachments, all the bad ideas and junk in our mind. And these shows and movies that we're so attached to. And we just have to watch. I wouldn't be a normal American if I didn't watch all these movies and TV shows. They're destroying our minds. Wake up. They're causing spiritual obesity in Catholics. Very deadly. After killing the virginal Maria Goretti for not going along with his evil desires, striking her 14 times with a brush hook, a special farm implement, he was arrested and taken to the local police station where he made a full confession. He never sought to escape. He did not hide or deny anything. He showed no remorse. Here is part of his confession. During the spring, thoroughly bored with a peasant's life to the neck, I conceived a desire for Marietta, which I had no reason to remove from my mind. I proposed my intention to her. She refused and from then on avoided me. That threw the fat into the fire. I determined that I would have her or kill her. Yesterday, I reached the end of my patience. I told myself that it had to be one way or the other. I would no longer bear frustration. When I pulled her into the kitchen, I threatened her with a brush hook to accommodate my desire or die. I did not expect her to resist me as furiously as she did. With her final refusal and outcry, that was it. I rained down blows with the brush hook upon her as though I were stripping corn or chopping wood. She fell and I left her for dead, thinking surely that no one could survive such a hewing. Realizing escape from the open marshes was futile, I hid the brush hook behind the toolbox, locked myself in my room, cast myself upon the bed, and awaited the inevitable. Confession of Mr. Serenelli. Taken to Rome for trial, he did not attempt to excuse himself in any way and even frustrated the lawyers who sought to reduce his sentence or plead for insanity. He made no defense for himself, but he did defend his victim, saying, Maria Goretti did not lend cause to my desire or lead me on in any way. Apprised of my intention, she did her best not to let it come about. She was a little girl, good and pure. That drew me. The result was the full sentence. Three years, solitary confinement, and 27 years of hard labor. In the courtroom, Asunta, the virgin martyr's mother, had the last word, I forgive Alessandra. After a stunned silence, many cried out indignantly, Never! And it should not be! And I would never forgive him! But she quickly faced those who spoke thus, saying, And suppose in turn, Jesus Christ does not forgive us. Alessandro survived the first three years, of which the nights were the hardest. He never dreamed at all. He made matchboxes, for which he was paid 20 cents per thousand. And later he made fibers from palms to be used for weaving. After surviving this most difficult part of his sentence, three years of solitary confinement, he learned that three others with the same sentence had killed themselves. And six had gone mad. Still his heart was unmoved, ever resentful and cynical of society and religion. He had no friends. Imagine that. Not surprised. 
Bitterness gnawed at him. Like a broken record, he kept thinking, was not her stubbornness as mad as my desire? If she only had submitted. That's a foretaste of hell, folks. It's a broken record. And you're stuck on yourself. You're caved in on yourself. You're folded in on yourself. Clearly, he needed some spiritual insulin to open up. An intervention was needed from heaven, from the pancreas of the heavenly parish. After six years of imprisonment, the little virgin martyr came to him in the dream we all know about, showing him the 14 lilies for the 14 wounds she received in her martyrdom. When she came to him, all dressed in white, It was he who now wanted to flee from her. He was trying to get away. She offered him the lily, saying, Alessandro, Alessandro, take them. He accepted them one by one. He responded. It was an opening. The insulin worked. As he took them, they turned into so many splendid flaming lights. And glucose started to flow into the cell of this soul. She then said, Alessandro, as I promised, your soul shall someday reach me in heaven. And he was filled with contentment, wonder of wonders. With the door open to the bloodstream, he desired, his desire was to be purified of all evil and then fulfilled in heaven with a purely spiritual friendship with this marvelous girl. When he awoke, it seemed that the rabid, choking, hellish, consuming feelings of hate, destruction, and bitterness that ruled him began to dissolve in the love of the virgin martyr. He changed. He started to open up to others. He showed interest in them, as well as taking his labors more seriously. He surprised many in his transformation from a sullen loner to a cheerful and cooperative friend. He slimmed down. He detached. He felt light. He fulfilled those words from the Psalms by King David that says, I have run the way of the commandments of my Lord. When thou didst dilate my heart, you enlarged me. I opened up and you came in. After a time, the bishop came to visit Alessandro and Alessandro said to the bishop, I want to cast myself upon God's mercy. I want to beg pardon from the family of her whom I destroyed. I want to go on hands and knees before Assunta Goretti and her children for what I have done. He then gave himself over with complete submission to confession, attendance at mass, spiritual exercises, holy communion and prayer. And he prayed especially to Marietta the little virgin martyr. He became a model prisoner. To fill his spare time, he read lots and lots of good books written by the great authors provided to him by the chaplain. See, he was replacing all that junk he put in there before. Not surprisingly, among his favorites was Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. If you've ever read it, you'll know why he liked that book. So we see how all the knots the devil helped him to tie before his conversion were now being untied by God and his grace. He even began to seek solitude voluntarily so that he could pray and meditate and be closer to God. Eventually, he was let out in 1929, three years early. He thought this too was from Marietta. But now new troubles began for him. Now he began to fulfill the words of the Psalms that read, When I was in distress, thou hast dilated me, thou hast enlarged me. What happened to him? Wherever he would find work, although he never complained, he did not blaspheme, give way to rage. He was the first in the field to work in the morning and the last to leave, scrupulously obeying orders. Nevertheless, When others discovered who he was, Alessandro Serenelli, the murderer of Maria Goretti, he was inevitably asked to leave. He was fired. 
Amazingly, various women tried to seduce him. One woman, the wife of his employer, another Potiphar's wife, said to him after trying to seduce him, you killed a girl for the very same thing I'm freely offering you. Have you become so holy since then? And do you fear a woman? Like Joseph of old, he ran. His heart was dilated. It was filled with grace. He knew his God. No. Another time, he was wrongly jailed merely on a suspicion. These sorts of things kept happening to him over and over again wherever he went. Clearly, the devil wanted him back and God was allowing it to test his virtue. He finally found peace when a Capuchin monastery received him as their gardener. Meanwhile, he finally met up with Asunta. Do you recognize me? He asked her. Yes, my son, responded Asunta tearfully. He threw himself at her feet and cried, Do you forgive me, Asunta? Dear Asunta, forgive me. Forgive what I have done to Marietta and to you. Asunta placed her hands upon his head, caressed his face, and famously said, Alessandro, Marietta forgave you. Christ has forgiven you. And why should not I also forgive? I forgive you, of course, my son. He arose and they embraced. At Christmas time, Asunta Goretti, with head held high and tears falling, took Asandro Serenelli by the hand as a mother takes a son and led him to Mass. At the altar rail, side by side, she and he, he who had killed her daughter, raised their open mouths to partake of the sacred flesh and the precious blood of Jesus found in Holy Communion. At Asunta's death, he wept and cried out, Dearest Mama Asunta, dearest Mama Asunta. Collapsing upon the bed of her feet, he kissed them, and then her hands and her face. At night, he always said his rosary before the candle-lighted picture of Marietta, saying, Marietta, Marietta, I wait for death. I await and long for the fulfillment of your promise. Your promise that I will be by your side in paradise. She fulfilled her promise with his peaceful death and the odor of sanctity in 1970. His spiritual diabetes was completely cured. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.